Good morning, everyone. And uh, may I give you all a very warm welcome as we meet together for worship here in Tobacco. And if you are visiting uh, with us today, you are also most welcome. A special word of welcome to our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Michael Waddell uh, from Belfast City Mission. Michael, thank you for coming to lead our worship. And we do look forward to what God has laid in your heart to share with us. <clears throat> There's no uh, children's church today. And also, well, please remember, today is the end of accounts for the year 23. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, all are warmly invited to our special New Year service next Sunday evening in Croke Moor at 7.30. And the speaker will be Mr. Alan Simpson with others taking part. It is uh, with deep regret I announce the death of Mrs. Jean McGregor, formerly of Moy Craig Road, Bally Oglach, who passed away peacefully at Camp Hill Nursing Home, Ballymena, on Friday, the 29th of December. Service of Thanksgiving to take place here on Tuesday, the 2nd of January at 11.30, followed by interment in the adjoining churchyard. Jean was a much loved member here and so as a congregation we convey our deepest sympathy to her daughter Florence and to the extended family, assuring them of our Christian love and prayerful support. Thank you. Good morning to you. Good morning. It's lovely to be here with you and to worship together uh, here in, in the Lord's house. <coughs> Some verses from uh, Proverbs, um, chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So we're coming to, to look unto the Lord, to trust in the Lord, to, to worship the Lord. So let's come and, and do that as we sing uh, two pieces at this stage. Paraphrase 19 and uh, the race that long in darkness pined and him 350 jesus name of wondrous love so let's praise god together <clears throat>
So let's come and talk to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that we can praise you and use this paraphrase and this hymn that we've just sung to help us to look up to you, as it were, and to, to look unto the Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are the true and the living God, the only one that deserves to be truly worshipped. We thank you that you created the heavens and the earth and you did that in six days and then you rested on the Sabbath, the Sabbath day. We thank you for that example that you gave to us as people so that we could have that day of rest, <coughs> that day of worship before Almighty God. We thank you that, that we have come today to, to worship you, to acknowledge you afresh. Thank you that you have come to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus. And we've been celebrating that in the last week or so. Jesus, who came to save his people from their sins, was born in Bethlehem all those years ago. And we thank you for that great message of the Christmas story that shows us that God loved this world and gave his only begotten son. Lord, we praise you for all that, that you have done by coming into this world, by coming and living amongst us and becoming that man who went to the cross. Thank you that you were willing to give your life as a ransom for many. And we praise you for the uh, significance of the cross that D Jesus died on and his burial and yet his resurrection, which brings him out of the grave into a new life, as it were. And that picture of death and resurrection that we all need in our lives spiritually. Lord, we pray that you will continue to work and fulfill that in our lives. We thank you for those uh, here today, Lord, who uh, have already committed their lives to you. And we pray that you will encourage them and help them and lead them on as, uh, as your people. And if there are others that have not come to that point of giving their lives to the Lord, that maybe today or in these next days as we move into a new year, the Lord, it will make us think of life Think of our lives here on earth, but think of how you offer us more than just a physical life, a spirit. You want to, us to receive a spiritual life. You want us to be born again of the Spirit of God and to believe in Jesus Christ. So thank you for what you can do in our lives and what, thank you what, for what you've done to make it possible, particularly through Jesus going to that cross and rising to life again. So continue to help us to, to look to you, Lord. We do pray that you will even forgive us for our sins because at times we struggle in certain ways through our lives. In our hearts, we have that tendency to go back into that old life and that old flesh. And yet, thank you that you help us to move on to... Uh, to go on towards that finishing line in the race that you have set before us. So help us to do that and help us to know you leading us on and helping us in these days. So we commit to this time to you, we commit our whole service to you and pray that you will be very much amongst us, moving amongst us by your Holy Spirit in these moments. And may we look unto you, look unto the Lord Jesus particularly as the only true saviour and messiah of all. Lord, we thank you again and pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Let me read some uh, words from John chapter 3.
John chapter 3, we're going to read from verse 22. So let's hear God's word. John 3, 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples, sorry, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given from given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear witness, bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly, because the bridegroom's voice, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Amen. We thank God for his word to us. Sorry, I think I was reading for the King James. I'm sorry, maybe that was different to what you were using, but I hope that's okay. (laughs) We'll look at it later on in that passage. Okay, so if some of the children want to come to the front, I'll join you there and we'll have a wee chat together. All right. Okay. So good to see you. Hope you have a nice Christmas then. Get some nice things. <laughs> good. There you are. Well, it's hard to believe we're going into a new year, aren't we? Tomorrow starts the starts the twenty twenty four. Let me read another verse. I'm sure you've maybe heard this verse before. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I wonder, when you came out of your house today, did you ask your mommy or daddy to get you a mechanic for the car before you jumped into it? Did you? No? Why not? (laughs) You don't think you need it? (laughs) I don't know what your cars are like, but (laughs) it sounds as if they're not good, but I'm not suggesting that. We don't usually do that, sure we don't. We don't need to do that. We tend to just come out, open the door, out of our houses, open the door, jump into the car. Is that not the way we do it, usually? And I wonder, did you come into church today and check that the pews were okay? Were they all put together right? You think they're in one piece? <laughs> no, we didn't do that either. You don't have a wee screwdriver in your pocket? No, just to check. <laughs> That's silly, isn't it? A wee bit silly thoughts, isn't it? But do you know what it's telling us? It's telling us that we show a type of faith to things around us. You just automatically come in and sit in the pews. They're well made, I'm sure. They look well made. (laughs) They're good quality, I would say. You just come in and you sit down or you you jump into the car and somebody else drives you. And you're actually trusting in the driver. Did you know that? You have to trust the driver does the right thing, (laughs) can drive properly. and So you're trusting your mum and dad or whoever's driving you. So it's showing faith in things around us we could say or or people Uh, and sometimes it's good to 
to, to bring it down to a simple way like that, just to, to, to explain faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus used this word belief, or believe in him, he says, or believeth in him. Chapter, chapter 3, verse 16, that well-known verse. And then he goes on and says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. So he doesn't really want to destroy and judge and condemn the world forever. He wants to save the world, that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth in him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And if you take those three verses, 16, 17, 18, the word believe or similar versions of it are said about six times. So believe is important. Jesus is talking to a religious man called Nicodemus, and he's already said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can I, an adult, become a baby again? Particularly in my mummy's womb, <laughs> inside my mummy. How could that happen? That doesn't make sense. And it, it, it doesn't make sense. An adult can't become a baby. We can't turn the clock back, as we say, and start all, life all over again. We have one life to live here. But Jesus is saying there's more to life for us all. We can have an everlasting life. A life that will be with God forever, with Jesus, our Savior forever. And that's why he uses this word, believe or believeth, on him. Uh, and he says that a few times there. So it's good to, to have a faith in other people, in other things maybe. And we tend to show that quite automatically. But it's good to have a personal faith in the Lord Jesus. And it's just simply saying, I believe in the Lord Jesus and giving our, ourselves to him and asking him, what can I do for you, Lord? How can I live here on earth as a Christian person, a Christian child or a Christian adult? Help us, help me to do that, Lord. And God will help you and God will be with you if you commit your life to him. And it's good to do that. I did it when I was 13, a wee bit older than, than you are, but... I felt I had to just ask the Lord to come into my life and give, give uh, him my life. And I believe he gave me everlasting life. So one day, you know, every Christian will be with the Lord Jesus. So it's good to, to have eternal life uh, as we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Do you want to go back to your seats or for your hymn or what is it normally done? Sorry. Go back to your seats and then we'll sing your, your hymn. Okay.
Let's continue to worship, worship God as we bring our tithes and offerings to him. The choir will be singing an anthem as well. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to pray for others uh, for a minute or two. Um, pray for yourselves. And uh, somebody was saying there was a, a bereavement. Uh, the, the lady had passed on. Um, so we'll pray for the family. <coughs> and uh, I'm here, obviously, as part of the Belfast City Mission, and I'll refer to it maybe later on before my sermon. Um, so we'll pray for the, the work of the Belfast City Mission as well. So let's uh, come to God, to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we do want to thank you and ask you now to come afresh to us and help us as we think of others and pray for others at this time in our service. We thank you for your love to us and to the whole world. And yet we know we live in a world that is... Sin has sin within it and has the effects of sin all around different parts of the world. And, and we see the, the conflicts uh, through our news programs uh, in Israel and Gaza and uh, Ukraine and Russia. And Lord, you know there's other places maybe not always highlighted, parts of Africa, parts of, of, of other South America or whatever, that maybe don't always hit the headlines and where sadly there's violence particularly towards your people and we do pray that Lord you will come into those situations and come and support your people in those countries in those situations where there is war and trouble and we pray simply that somehow you will bring a, a peaceful settlement eventually to some of these places but ultimately your peace will come through Jesus to many more people around this world. We do pray for this local congregation and thank you for all that you've been doing here and uh, over the, the years in Toberkey. And we thank you that you have called, uh, their mini your, your, called a minister to them, as it were, and they've... they've received that minister recently and thank you for for his few months already in the, the work and do help him and encourage him and support him as the minister and do lead him in these days as he has time with his his family his mother particularly 
and thank you for all that you will do uh, in and through him and the elders and other uh, people in the congregation who will lead and, and uh, take responsibility in different areas of, of the church life. Thank you for uh, your faithfulness to the people of God here down through the years and we pray you'll continue to encourage them and bless them and as we've just been reminded that many will respond to that call uh, and receive Jesus into their hearts. Thank you Lord we uh, sorry we also pray for this family that's been bereaved we pray your special hand upon the family uh, of this lady who has just since re recently passed on and we pray for that family circle and pray your comfort and support will be upon them and that they will know uh, the strength of God even in and through the funeral uh, coming up this week and that you'll be moving amongst them and ministering to them. Lord, we pray for others who maybe have been bereaved in recent times for different reasons. I uh, heard about a, a car accident too, and we pray that for that family, and we pray your, your hand upon that family here locally too. Lord, just be with and minister into the lives of the, the people uh, and all who, who need you at this time. Maybe some are sick and struggling. Uh, in their bodies and, and you know that you know all about that Lord and again we thank you that that you were concerned with people on earth and you you could touch them and help them and heal them uh, and yet Lord Jesus you uh, are even praying for us for for your people today in in heaven <coughs> seated at the, the right hand side of, of God the Father and we thank you for that assurance that you're you're even interceding for us uh, today as we meet together so come afresh and come and uh, move amongst us and move amongst this uh, group of people here and, and all connected to tober key uh, presbyterian lord just bless and watch over us all lord thank you for the the work that i represent the city mission work and thank you for the ministry over many years and again thank you for the the way you've uh, brought a few uh, new missionaries to us recently three three new men and we thank you and pray that maybe if if it is your will that you'll open up other opportunities for newer men to come because some men are retiring soon too so we pray that your blessing will be upon the work you'll guide us and direct us and help us as a mission, bless the board and ultimately Willie Logan as he uh, leads us. And we just do bring everything before you uh, about the, the Belfast City Mission too. So thank you for these few moments, just bowing in your presence, thinking of others elsewhere in the world, but also praying for this local congregation. And we pray that again, they will know you with them as we all leave one year behind uh, and move into a, a new year uh, after midnight tonight so bless and watch over us and encourage us and may we look unto you in these days in jesus name amen so it's good to be with you thanks jim again for the the invite and the upper or the the, the welcome and, and all that uh, has been said and we want to just now look to look to the lord and ask him to to, to bless uh, his word so we'll just have a short prayer as we turn to this portion of scripture father we thank you for your blessings upon us thank you for your ministry to us and we pray that your word will speak to our hearts lord we all need you we all need to hear from you and we pray that your word again will challenge each one of us direct us in the right way or show us that we need to to change something or whatever lord just show us the way and help us to live like jesus uh, here in this community and wherever we are uh, in in belfast in my case and so lead us on and bless us and encourage us we pray and speak through your word in jesus name amen 
We have to go back nearly 200 years to see the beginning of the Belfast City Mission. And it actually started in 1827. <clears throat> and I know you've had a connection with some of the, uh, the missionaries over the years. Um, my previous boss, Bobby Brown, and then before that, when I came on staff, George Ferguson, I think you would know him. And then just recently, the last few years, Willie Logan uh, has been our, our boss, the Executive Secretary. There was another man, William uh, Cochrane, who was the, the first missionary, or as he was called then, agent. He was known as an agent when he first started in 1827. And in those days, church life was maybe a wee bit stricter and uh, about things, and particularly you had to have your best suit on and your shirt and tie for the men, obviously, and maybe the best dress for the ladies. Uh, and they were very particular about these things way back in 1827 and sadly some people felt they couldn't go to church because all they had was a, a set of dirty clothes basically it wasn't very uh, acceptable really by some church people and maybe sometimes some of that can come through even till today but it's not just about dressing up but it's nice to it's nice to be presented well before God of course but what happened then was that people ended up in groups and communities where there were sort of like a type of slum area in Belfast or different parts of, of Belfast in the 1820s or like the slums in the 30s and that's you know it wasn't easy for people to come to church if they wanted to basically because of mainly those reasons of, of dress etc but this man was called to, to come by some ministers, including a few Presbyterian ministers, who helped to set up the Belfast City Mission. And he, uh, he arrived from Lisburn to Belfast, and he was the first official agent or missionary of the City Mission. He was offered a place to, to be based in, and they called it a station in those days. Uh, we call them mission halls today. And uh, a lot of this was recorded in a book by a man called Noel Davidson, um, a book called Who Cares? And it goes right from 1827 right up to the early 2000s. Let me quote a wee bit of the introduction uh, from Noel Davidson's book. Further agents were appointed to visit the homes of poverty-stricken people who inhabited the squalid courts and entries of the town and <coughs> preached the gospel of light and hope in accessible stations. Then through days of famine and hardship and through days of economic advance and spiritual revival, the work kept on expanding. When Belfast became a city in 1888, the town mission changed its name to the city mission and so the growth went on. The mission, was, has, sorry, the mission has continued to work quietly and effectively in the city, adapting to the needs of the different generations right up until the present day. Whatever the age of people being addressed or the method of approach being employed, one thing has never changed. This, sorry, that, that is the aim of the mission, which is to see men, women, boys and girls led to Christ for salvation. So that's um, Noel Davison's account or some a wee bit of his introduction in his book. But it's not just about how people view us necessarily it's ultimately it has to go back to to god and god i believe setting the whole organization up through people <clears throat> and really god is the source of everything of course life but ultimately the, the idea of mission comes from god and we have an example of god giving to us his son and that's a mission uh, suggestion he gave his only begotten son and we see that in uh, the Gospel of, of John, as we referred to earlier, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So <clears throat> the city mission continues. Uh, as I was saying in my prayer, there's some uh, recent times, uh, over my time, I've been in the work since 2005, uh, heading towards this week, I'll mark 19 years in the mission. <clears throat> and uh, I started in Glencairn Mission Hall 
uh, where there's a man called George Lunn uh, is still there officially, but he'll be retiring in June when he turns 70. So when we get to the age of 70, we're asked to move on uh, and to retire from our work. Um, some have retired before that. In fact, a man has just retired in December there. Uh, that's, today is his last day officially. Uh, Tom Gamble. And he uh, is <coughs> just retiring, as I say, in his mid-60s. I don't think he's quite 65 yet, actually, but uh, he's had some health issues too. So there are some men retiring, and we've got another man retiring at the end of January. So uh, it's, we're going to lose a few, three men, uh, and we lost a couple the previous to retirement, I mean. Um, so, but we've got three new men in. Um, Joseph and his brother David Kenaway, Kenaway have come in. Uh, some of you think know Joe Kenaway. And there's a fella, Mark uh, Porter, from Dremore Direction, and uh, he's joined us as well. So things are encouraging, going on well in some ways. Uh, there's also retirement, so if anybody feels they're, <laughs> they're being led and called to, to something like the Belfast City Mission, uh, do consider that and feel uh, that you make contact and maybe consider the work of the mission, not just to, to pray for us, but maybe could be part of it as well. In the present hall, uh, I'm in, uh, this is my third hall. I was not only in Glencairn City Mission, I was in Canton Street City Mission Hall, which sadly is being closed now, this day too. Um, we just felt we couldn't keep it open, so uh, the board makes decisions. There's a board of some ministers, some elders, um, mainly from Presbyterian uh, churches, and uh, they make the final decision, and they had come to me a couple of times, moved me from Glencairn to Canton Street, and then a couple of years ago from Canton Street to Island Street, where I am today. So I've been over two years on Island Street, and it's the one down near the, the two big cranes, that sort of, that'd be the nearest to the two big cranes that you see in the pictures of Belfast. Uh, and uh, that, that area, um, Island Street touches D Street, and D Street sort of goes down towards the Harlan and Wolf area uh, of Belfast, where there's still a wee bit of work going on there. <coughs> so that's where I am now, and during the past year, this time last year, the first Two Sundays in January 2023, um, <clears throat> I decided to look at John chapter 3, verse 1 to 21, and take a series of four sermons looking at that passage, zo zooming, zooming, zooming in at it, sorry, in different ways, and, and uh, trying to cover as much of those 21 verses, looking at Nicodemus coming to Jesus. And I'm sure it's familiar, many of these things, I wasn't going to look at that today, but just to summarize that quickly before we look on into our next portion of John 3. Uh, Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus, wanting to talk to Jesus, wanting to find out something about this man, Jesus. He's heard about him, he's seen him maybe doing things, miracles, and he's wanting to know. And Jesus very quickly says two main things to him. Firstly, you must be born again. And secondly, believe in him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was telling them those two main things. And later on in, in John's Gospel, we read of Nicodemus uh, coming with Joseph of Arimathea, asking for the body of Jesus to bury him. And although that maybe sounds a strange thing, but I believe he was standing up for Jesus at that time. And earlier in John chapter 12, I think it is, he says to the council, Nicodemus, who's one of the council, says, you know, maybe this man, there's something going on about this, there's something true about this man after all. So he's starting to, to, to suggest that he was following Jesus. Maybe he was a, a secret disciple, as Joseph was seen, what Joseph of Arimathea is described as as well. But he ta they, the two of them prepare the body for burial. They, with a few women in the background, seem to be the only ones that literally come to the grave of Jesus as they're bearing the body of Jesus. And then we know, of course, he rises to life. Uh, but Nicodemus at that point, I believe, was saying, I'm following Jesus, I'm trusting in Jesus. 
We move on into the next, uh, the final verses that we read there, and suddenly the scene changes. Uh, it's no longer Jesus and Nicodemus talking to each other in the city of Jerusalem, but he's, Jesus actually appears. It says, after these things, referring to what's just happened, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized John was also baptizing in Anon near Salem uh, because there was much water there and they came to be baptized. So John, who's known as John the Baptist, was baptizing people in the Jordan River. Uh, again, we probably know uh, something of the story of John. But we see John is not there just to, to be seen as an important person. He's actually pointing away from himself and pointing to a greater one. He's pointing to Jesus who's just arrived uh, in their midst. And Jesus and the disciples uh, were involved in baptism. I think it was actually Jesus. If you do look into chapter 4, you'll see that it says it's not Jesus baptizing, but his disciples are baptizing. Um, <clears throat> so J Jesus had asked his disciples to baptize as well as John the Baptist with some of his disciples who were still with him. They were baptizing people. So that's the picture we suddenly are presented with. And we want to note a few things, just uh, four things quickly about this passage. <clears throat> and the first thing is the helpers dispute, as I've called it. The helpers are like the disciples. John the Baptist in chapter one is described in this way. One crying in the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord. So he's fulfilling a prophecy from Isaiah 40 by crying in the wilderness. He's sharing the message of God with other people who come out to see him in the wilderness. And he's baptizing people as well. If people responded and said they wanted to trust in God, he would baptize them. So that was his uh, role in life and it's amazing how even God through the prophet Isaiah 700 years before the life of John uh, is predicting this prophesying it and so John fulfills a prophecy say from about 700 years before him and that's God only God could work that out only God can say something hundreds of years before it happens and it happens Surely, and that got, to me, that reinforces the Bible and reinforces who God really is. John, as I said, had uh, disciples with him, and one of them in chapter John 1 it tells us that Andrew was a disciple of John, but he starts following Jesus. John says, it's not me you should really be following. There's a greater one coming. There's another one coming, and this is what we see here, particularly in this uh, passage today, John is pointing away from himself and he's pointing to, to Jesus. There's a crowd of people and some of the translations present it slightly differently here, but the King James talks about a crowd of people and people within the crowd are causing a dispute between the helpers of John and the helpers of Jesus. And I think some of the other translations, the more modern ones would say, a single person is causing trouble. <laughs> so a slightly different version, but there's at least one man, if not a few people, who have come maybe from the Pharisees or maybe are Pharisees in amongst the crowd that are watching John and suddenly see Jesus with his disciples arriving. And that's what they're looking and they try to start this dispute between them they're trying to say well surely you've been doing this already so why why is this man jesus suddenly coming on board and being part of this and, you know it's like a competition here is it and and then they're trying to stir it all up between them but they're also referring to the law about purification and how purification was a, an important thing to them as jewish people they prepared themselves to come to god they they washed themselves, they, they freshened themselves up or whatever, and that was part of their preparation to worship God in those days. 
But this crowd or this one man or a couple of people in this crowd are trying to cause this dispute uh, and make it awkward for John and Jesus and his disciples. And so that's the first sort of main thing that we see here. <clears throat> and it wasn't uh, some of these rabbis or, or some of these uh, people who were causing this trouble were, were more concerned about the, the letter of the law, as we say, rather than about the true meaning and spirit of the law. So they were more worried about that, and that was what they were fight, fighting with, as it were, and using against John the Baptist and against Jesus. So they, they seem to be getting it wrong, these, these one or two or three or four, whoever is in, involved in this crowd that are causing the dispute. But John leads us into our second thought, tries to s suggest that it's not really about him uh, and he points away from himself and he shows humility and that's the second thought, the humility shown. So John who has been preparing the way for the Lord and telling people about this in the wilderness, in the desert, um, it's again saying it's not about me it's about the other man it's about Jesus the greater one in fact John says in response to that uh, those people or that, that one person who was causing the trouble uh, he says in verse 28 ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ but that I am sent before him so he's clearly pointing to a greater one a, a different one he is pointing to the christ the true christ the word christ is a greek word apparently and uh, comes from the greek language and messiah comes from the hebrew and that's the basically the same uh, meaning same person as it were you could say so the promise of the messiah in the old testament now is seen as the christ jesus christ so his name wasn't, it wasn't just a, a second name as it were. Christ means the anointed one that's come down from God. So God's anointed is the Christ. But he, so that's why John is starting to point away from himself and point towards Christ. I am not the Christ, he says. And then he goes on to explain by using a, a lovely picture. Verse 29, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore, this my joy is fulfilled. He must increase, I must decrease. So you can see the humility there. He's pointing away from himself. And it's a challenge to think about that because it's telling us to, to be careful how we <laughs> react towards people. You know, we aren't really important, particularly compared to Jesus, to God, but even, in a sense, others should be more important than ourselves as well. And that's something of God's humility working in us. Another example of humility I came across when I read a book about Hudson Taylor. And he was, he had been in China a number of years as a missionary, and he went on furlough for a period of time and he went to Australia to take some meetings and in one particular church which happened to be Presbyterian I'm told in the book uh, in Melbourne there was uh, a minister who wanted to introduce this man and he used lots of very important big words to introduce Hudson Taylor and say well this is an important person this is a great missionary and this sort of thing was said so what happened, Hudson Taylor quietly steps up into the pulpit and he says simply this, Dear friends, I am a servant of an illustrious master. So you can imagine the word illustrious might have been used as building uh, Hudson Taylor up. So he just says, I'm a servant of an illustrious master. So he's pointing away from himself. Yes, God calls people to do these things and to be missionaries, to be uh, ministers, etc. And that's part of, of the church life. That's part of the, the ministry across the world. 
But at the end of the day, John the Baptist or Hudson Taylor, they're trying to say, it's not about me, it's about the Lord Jesus. And we should all be like that. Paul writes to the Galatians, says, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So we bring ourselves to the cross. We offer ourselves to God in humility. Surely that's what it's like. If we have the opposite of that, we're, we're full of pride. If we're full of pride, there's no room for God, really, in a sense, if you put it that way. It's like filling up a glass or something. If you have it all full up of water, you'll not get any more into it. It'll just spill out, obviously. But if, if it's all of me in, in, the, in the glass or in my life, and it's very little of God, then sadly maybe God will maybe not do much with us. <laughs> I can't maybe do if we're still about me and my, my life is more important. So we're, we're being told it's not that way. We're coming, if we come to the cross and bow before the Lord Jesus, we're giving our sins to him. We're asking him to take away our sins, to, to cover our sins, to, to deal with our sin. Uh, and he alone can forgive us for those sinful things in our lives. So then that leads us on to the third thought, the honouring given. So he's not only, he's already sort of honouring Jesus, but he's pointing away from himself by showing humility, but he's also uh, highlighting Jesus. And Jesus is like the bridegroom. It's, it's another picture we have of Jesus later on in, in the gospel or in the, the Bible. Exactly in Revelation, he'll come back and we will be with him as the church. We, the church, the bride of Christ, will be with Jesus one day. And this is a sort of similar picture. But John is also saying, I'm more like the, the best man or just a friend that's been invited to the wedding. I'm not Jesus, I'm not the Christ, I'm not the bridegroom. Jesus alone has that role. So he's already been honouring, but he also adds to that by saying three other things here uh, about honouring Jesus. And the first one is, uh, he is from above, verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. That's actually two things there. He cometh from above and he's greater than all. Verse 31, the last wee bit. He that cometh from heaven is above all. So he, Jesus, this man who's just arrived in our midst with his disciples, he has come from above. He's come from heaven to this earth. And that's an amazing thing. John is pointing to Jesus and honoring Jesus. He must increase, I must decrease, he said in verse 30. He's also above all, Jesus. He was a man. He, was, he looked like any other man in those days in that part of the world in the Middle East and yet he was God who had come down from above in that man fully God fully man we say sometimes so he was above all he was from above he was greater than all and thirdly he was a witness to us he has come down as the true witness verse 32 and what he hath seen and heard that he testifieth and no man receiveth his testimony he that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. Uh, so he's come as the, the testifier, the, the witness to us. And then very quickly, the final thought is the hopeful offer, the last verse. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. So Jesus, or John, the apostle, I think, is writing at this stage uh, something relating to John and John's um, pointing towards Jesus. And he's simply saying, this is what God has come to do, to offer us an amazing hope for the future and ultimately in heaven itself. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand but we have to respond by either believing or not believing. And that's what we, everybody does one way or the other. Uh, if we believe in that son, we have everlasting life. If we do not believe, 
we do not have life and the wrath of God is upon that person who does not believe. And that's not an easy thing to explain and to, to speak about. And yet we have to give both sides of the story. The Bible's very clear and time and time again, particularly through John's Gospel, it's either believing or believing not. And this, this comes through. And so we need to respond. Are we, are we with Jesus now and going to be with him forever in his everlasting heaven? Or have we rejected him or turned from him and gone or continue to go our own way? We need to, to trust in him and believe in him. Otherwise, we will not see heaven uh, with Jesus. So may the Lord take these few thoughts to us and, and apply them to our hearts. The time just to sing that wee piece at the end. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, our final hymn, Lord, you left your throne. Thank you. to him that is able to <coughs> keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Saviour be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen <laughs>